celebrate Bloom's Day, Irish verse in song and prose. And we're also here to celebrate reading and literacy with the Literacy Project. The Literacy Project provides free access to education for adults in Hampshire and Franklin County who need a second chance to get their high school diploma. Our students study in five subject areas, reading, writing, math, science, and social studies. And along the way, they fall in love with the power of reading and the power of learning. I'd like to read a short quote from one of our students that talks about the joy and freedom in learning. Pat said, getting my GED was so amazing. Now I have options. I have freedom. No matter what else, I have a freedom to use my mind and learn whatever I want. And that's a big freedom. How you doing folks? This is uh, Joseph Lubold. I uh, studied at the Northampton Literacy Project. And I'm here to talk to you today a little about a donation. Quite frankly, it's because of great people like you who helped me. This year, just a sh couple short weeks ago, I graduated. And I can't tell you. I still, I swell up, I'm sorry. It's a little emotional. But at 60 years old, in two months I will be. This could have never, ever came to fruition in my life. So I thought, now I did it. And I did it with the help of the Literacy Project from great people who had the fortitude to donate. It's unbelievable. The education you receive is everything. Well, people like me didn't get it. I fell through the cracks. Whatever happens, happens. Some people fall on hard times. But an education is so important, and we should never give up on it. And I thank God people donated and didn't give up on me. Well, I think James Joyce would completely identify with Joe, and he would be just so heartened to know that the language that he constructed and so beautifully crafted around everyday life and that Dublin indeed was the incubation for that inspiration but he became a little disillusioned with the censure and the sort of veneer of respectability that hung over everyday activities and so he left. Red Hanrahan's song about Ireland, William Butler Yeats. The old brown thorn tree breaks in two, high over common strand. Under a bitter black wind that blows, it blows from the left hand. Our courage breaks, our courage breaks, like an old tree in a black wind and dies. And we have hidden in our hearts the eyes of Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan. The wind has bundled up the clouds high over Knock and Array and thrown the thunder all on the stones for all that Maeve can say. Angers that are like noisy clouds have kept our hearts a beat, and we have all bent low and low and kissed the quiet feet of Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan. The yellow pool has overflowed high over Cluth and Bear, and the wet winds are blowing out of the clinging air. Like heavy flooded waters, our bodies and our blood, but purer than a tall candle, before the holy rood, is Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan. Oh, the old brown thorn tree breaks in two, high over common strand. Of 
Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan. The wind has bundled up the clouds high over Nochnare. We have all bent low and low and kissed the quiet feet of Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan. To the clinging air Like heavy flooded waters Our bodies and our blood But pure than at all can do Before the holy rood Is Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan I sit on the board of the Literacy Project. I'm so honored to be part of this project where adults are turning their lives around and they're learning at all ages. They never stop and they don't give up. I'm so happy that you're here tonight to donate. Happy Bloom's Day. He went on this date with Nora Arnica, uh, the love of his life. He'd only known her for four months, in contrast to William Butler Yeats who was a head of James Joyce and who, of course, suffered famously from unrequited love. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths and wrought with gold and silver light, the blue and the dim, and the dark cloths of night, of night and light, and the half-light. I would spread the cloths under your feet, but I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. Dreams all under your feet Tread soft 
have spread my clothes all under your feet, but I, being poor, have only my dreams. I would spread the clothes all under your feet, but I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams all under your feet, tread so All under your feet Tread softly Softly You tread on my dreams You tread on my dreams My dreams My dreams uh, I haven't read you uh, in 20 million billion years and I've forgotten all about it. The, and so to do this uh, piece for Rosie, um, I looked up online for some famous uh, Joyce quotes and no matter what the sources you see, some of the same quotes and things repeated over and over and over again. Um, so I, I found some other ones. And it's interesting, uh, as I study them, um, in, in just their own context, I realized uh, some of the genius and that the settings that some of his lines are can read much differently uh, if you haven't read the book. Here's an example, all right? Here's a quote that says, and it's also a great one-liner, I think, I mean, joke. Bury the dead. Say Robinson Crusoe was true to life. Well... Then Friday would bury Thursday, if you can come to look at it. Well, where did this come from? I mean, you know, it, it, to put it in other phrases is that, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about dead people, you know, and jeez, uh, I mean, imagine this, Robinson Crusoe. You want to hear a great one-liner? All right. Well, Robinson Crusoe died. If he died on the island, who's going to bury him? Well, that's Friday. <laughs> What day did you bury him up? That's a Thursday. <laughs> and he says, if you, in his way of saying, uh, get it, is if you can come to look at it. I mean, this is, uh, you know, take a piece, any piece you want. Uh, uh, here's his, his, one of his famous pieces. Of course, he was going blind. And, and he says, is out of the, uh, now I'm taking this out of context. I have no idea what part of the book it was written in, when it, when it was written in. He goes, has all vanished since? If I open and am forever in the black, and I have no idea what this is, Adiapan, Adiapan, A-D-I-A-P-H-A-N-E, the black Adiapan, which I guess is really, really black. Um, and then he pauses. So I'll repeat this again. Has all vanished since? His eyes are closed. And he's asking it out. Someone tells, open your eyes now. He says, I would. One moment. That's his quote. It, but it's, what's he saying? You know, if, if someone's saying to you, come on, open up your eyes. He says, I'm afraid. Oh my God, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. The Song of Wandering Angus. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands 
and walk among the long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun.
Hello, my name is Fruhar. I am a student at the Literacy Project in Amherst. Uh, I joined this program in 2019 in order to become ready for college. This program has helped me to improve my English, my math skills, as well as my knowledge in other areas. The Literacy Project is uh, not only about college preparation. Here you will have also the opportunity to join a great and supportive uh, community. Thank you very much, the Literacy Project, for making it possible for us to achieve our educational goals. So we'll have a reading today from Chris Devine. We'll have our musicians play our Yeats songs and we will think about Dublin and raise a class to literature, literacy and the pleasures of reading. And in our reading from Ulysses, you will see that the language is indeed accessible. It has the reputation for being a difficult book, but in fact it's the idiom of my own childhood. It's the way my mother and father spoke, and I hope that you will consider sometime just picking it up and even picking up a page and reading here and there. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him on the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, Introibo ad alteri dei. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called out coarsely, Come up, Kinch! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! Solemnly he came forward and mounted the round gun rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower the surrounding land, and the awaking mountains. Then, catching sight of Stephen Dedalus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him. Equine in its length, and at the light, untonsured hair, grained and hued like pale oak. Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror and then covered the bow smartly. Back to barracks, he said sternly. He added in a preacher's tone, oh, for this so dearly beloved is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood and wounds. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment little trouble about those white corpuscles. Silence all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, slow whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Chrysostomos. Two shr strong, shrill whistles answered through the calm. Thanks, old chap, he cried briskly. That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown. The plump, shadowed face and sullen oval jowl recalled a prelate, patron of the arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. A mockery of it, he said gaily. Your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over to the parapet laughing to himself. Stephen Dedalus stepped up, followed him wearily halfway, and sat down on the edge of the gun rest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl, and lathered cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. Ah, my name is absurd too. Malachi Mulligan, two dactyls. But, it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like the buck himself. Oh, we must go to Athens. Will you come, if I can get the aunt to fork over 20 quid? He laid the brush aside and laughing with delight cried, Oh, will he come, the Jejun Jesuit? Ceasing, he began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan, Stephen said quietly, Oh, yes, my love. 
How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. Oh, God, isn't he dreadful, he said frankly. A ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. God, these bloody English, bursting with money and indigestion. Because he comes from Oxford. <laughs> you know, Dedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife blade. He shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a Black Panther, Stephen said. Where's his gun case? A woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said, with energy and growing fear. Out here in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther. You saved men from drowning, but I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on here, I'm off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade and he hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Oh, scutter, he cried th thickly. He came over to the gun rest and, thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, Ah, oh, lend us a loan of your na nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up, on show by its corner, a dirty, crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly, and then, gazing over the handkerchief, he said, Hmm, the bard's nose rack. A new art color for our Irish poet's snot green. <laughs> you can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair oak pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly. Isn't the sea what Algy calls it, a great sweet mother? The snot green sea, the scrotum tightening sea. Epi, oh, nopa ponta, not Daedalus, the Greeks. Oh, I must teach you. you, you must read them in the original. Thalata, Thalata. She is our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mailboat, clearing the harbor mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly, his gray searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Well, oh, someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, when your dying mother asked you, Buck Mulligan said. Uh, I'm hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her. And you refused. Uh, there is something sinister in you. He broke off again and lathered again lightly his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely mummer, he murmured to himself. Oh, Kinch, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care, in silence, seriously.
activity, I guess, uh, leaves home, and your name is Nora Barnacle. Well, looking for love, because if you have a last name like Barnacle, you <laughs> scrape off being single. <laughs> she did very well, actually. I mean, Nora met a young man named James Joyce. She was 20, he was 22. They fell in love, of course, ran away from uh, Ireland, left Ireland, and lived a life on the road. And, of course, you know, James uh, wrote uh, the book Ulysses, of which Nora had only read 17 pages of all <laughs> That's 17 more pages than I could ever get to. <laughs> but, you know, they had a, a very bitter relationship with Ireland. It was very hard. So they lived abroad, Paris, Trieste, moved around. And when they were flush with money, of course, then they, uh, they, they lived well. When they weren't flush, they lived like anybody else, going between Paris, Trias, ups and downs, just like any couple in the world. <laughs> well, I'll let them tell you the story of this, all right? Let's hear about it all, Nora. Genius, it was real. Or a bronze, or a play. 
So my name is Kiara and I wanted to share my experience at the Literacy Project. So I started in February 2021 and I completed getting my high set in three months. It's possible. A little scary, but completely worth it. 100% possible. Um, I've been out of school for over 10 years and wasn't a really good student and was really nervous. Um, you know, I'd already kind of had those negative thoughts in my head. I was a poor student. I didn't do, do well grade wise. Like my grades were always low, no matter how hard I studied. Like in my head, I was like, I just am not going to succeed. Um, and I couldn't be farther from the truth. And Beth over at the Literacy Project helped me realize that. And I am so grateful to her and to what everybody at the Literacy Project does and all of the donors. Um, I love you guys. Like, I am so elated that I went to the Literacy Project and I, I wish that I had done it sooner. About living in Paris. <laughs> In Dublin, slum conditions Makes me think of Galway and the open sea Makes me think of Lucia, the year that she was born. If exile is a mission, then one day, someday, someday she'll be famous. I'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsors for our program. 
for their generous support and to all Friends of the Literacy Project who support and sustain our classes in five towns, Amherst, Northampton, Greenfield, Orange, and Ware. Bloomsday sponsors today are Renaissance Builders, Greenfield Savings Bank, Rob and Mary Cohn, Greenfield Cooperative Bank, Snow and Sons Landscaping, Albert Allen Insurance, and of course, to Ryan and Casey for the lovely beverages. Thank you to all who believe in words and music and the power of reading. We thank you for tonight's performance. You can open your eyes now. I will. One moment. Has all vanished since? If I open, am I forever in the black adiaphane? We're so busy preparing for the great beyond in this half of heaven. Which one you look for it is here on earth? When I play on my fiddle at Dooney, folk dance like a wave on the sea. My cousin is Prisa Kilvarnet, my brother and Makarabui. I passed my brother and cousin, they read in their books of prayer. I read in my book of songs I bought at the Sligo Fair. When we come to the end of time, and Peter, sitting in state, you will smile on the three old spirits, but call me first through the gate. For the good are always the merry, save by an evil chance. And the merry love the fiddle, and the merry love to dance. And when the folk there spy me, they will all come up to me and cry, here is the fiddler of Dooney, and dance like a wave on the sea.
and thank you to my wild Irish band of musicians, both the women and men, who've been with me for many years as collaborators and friends. There's Katie Coleman, flute and tin whistle. There's Chris Devine, violin and fiddle. And Ulysses, Michael Haley, the wit and wisdom of James Joyce. Michael Morgan, guitar. Piper Pichette, harp. Brooke Steinhauser, chanteuse. Nikki Whitridge, violin and fiddle. And from the Wild Irish Women archives of James Joyce, Stephanie Carlson and Mo McGilligat. And I should know all these by heart. Why did I have to look down? Because, never know, I might forget one. And that would be a mortal sin. And that would be a sin for which James Joyce would have me roasting below because he's up there looking down on us all. Thank you, James, for your wonderful works of literature. And William Butler Yeats. <laughs>